1979, America's most notorious losers, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, were losers no more. Just four years after their birth in the NFL, welcome to the playoffs. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers against the Philadelphia Eagles in a game that has been dubbed everything from the impossible dream to the respect bowl. Against Philadelphia, the NFC Central Division champion Buccaneers spent 60 minutes earning the respect of the entire nation as they totally dominated the highly favored Eagles. Running back Ricky Bell carried the ball 38 times for 142 yards and two touchdowns as Tampa Bay controlled the tempo from the start, coasting to a 24-17 triumph. Only two years and five days after ending their infamous 26-game losing streak, the Buccaneers stood just one game away from the Super Bowl. But first, there was the NFC Championship and the Los Angeles Rams to contend with. the most fiercely fought and brilliantly executed defensive matchups in NFL history resulted in neither team scoring a touchdown. However, three Los Angeles field goals forced the Bucks into desperate late game maneuvers. Trailing nine to nothing, Tampa Bay's final prayers rode with quarterback Mike Ray but his touchdown to tight end Jimmy Giles was canceled by a penalty. The reality of being so close settled over Tampa Stadium. But the amazing thing wasn't that they lost. It was that an expansion team could get to this stage in only four years. In 1979, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers went from worst to first. Fans of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are experts on the subject of defeat. Together with their team, they were the butt of jokes from coast to coast during their inaugural 26-game losing streak. You see my watch? It's been the only consistent Buccaneer since they were born. <laughs> it's never stopped running. However, the Bucks faithful had a dream. And in 1979, these long-suffering fans would fill Tampa Stadium and sing a brand new tune. Tampa Bay followers watched their team overcome unprecedented difficulties. Through patient, shrewd drafting and sharp trading, key ingredients in a five-year program developed by owner Hugh Culverhouse and head coach John McKay. Well, the reason I had a five-year plan, I had a five-year contract. See, I had a six-year plan if I had a six-year contract or a three-year plan. 
And, and so now everybody says, well, how can McKay be so intelligent at five years? Well, that was the length of the contract. Uh, that's, that's how intelligent I am. But we said, we'll build the house, we'll build the foundation first, and we ain't gonna tell people what the house looks like till we get it all built. But if it's not gonna wash away in a flood, we're gonna have a good foundation. McKay unveiled his foundation against Detroit during the 79 home open. As usual, the Buccaneer defense was talented and disciplined. It could raise bumps and score points. On offense, there were young and talented runners like Johnny Davis, Rick Burns, George Ragsdale, and number 43, Jerry Eckwood, who debuted with 121 yards. There was also speed and depth at tight end with Jimmy Giles, number 88, and Jim Obradovich as the Bucks won, sitting down 31 to 16. Along here is some coach who caught a lot of hell for bringing me here. <laughs> and everybody else. And bringing everybody, all your other hoods here, too. <laughs> here it is, Coach McCain, you guys. say it's better to be lucky than good, but in 1979, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers were both. Five straight wins placed them at the top of the NFC Central, with their most impressive victory coming during week four. Against the Los Angeles Rams, the Buccaneers' offensive line was awesome. There was number 61, Greg Roberts, a rookie at guard, while Charlie Hanna was a converted defensive lineman at tackle. Together with center Steve Wilson, Dave Revis, Craig Horton, Darrell Austin, and George Jarno, the Rams' charge was manhandled. In a 21-6 victory, Tampa Bay's defense held the Rams scoreless during their last 16 possessions. The Bucks were driving home their point. And in the season's fifth week, the Chicago Bears failed to disprove Tampa Bay's boast. Jerry Eckwood dashed 61 yards for one score, while Doug Williams delivered the deciding points in the final minutes for a 17-13 victory. With five straight wins, Tampa Bay's start was the best in pro football. Now that we are winning, people are going to have to say, because they know I'm still dumb, they're going to have to say they must have a lot of good players, and, and that's good. In Rodney Dangerfield, Buccaneer players seemed to get no respect, except when it was their head coach talking. I think these players are as good as any players in football, but they happened to be on a team that didn't have enough of them. Therefore, they were lumped together, oh, they're just the Buccaneers. One man who had never been considered just a Buccaneer is Tampa Bay's defensive end, Leroy Selden. He is a complete football player. He's highly intelligent. He's in tremendous shape. You cannot fool him, and you're not going to block him with one person. Leroy Selman's pass rushing feats have almost become legendary. But what separates number 63 from the rest? is that he plays the run as well as the pass. And because of this, Leroy Selman was the most decorated defensive player last year in the NFL. Buck 
fans were equally grateful for another first round selection. Riding an offensive line that was now equal to his talents, Ricky Bell was able to produce the kind of year that is expected from someone who was once the NFL's number one draft pick. The workhorse of the buck attack, Bell carried a club record 283 times for 1,263 yards. The emergence of Ricky Bell coincided with the development of number 88, Jimmy Giles, a tight end who could block as well as he could catch passes. Obtained from Houston in 1978, along with an exchange of first round draft picks, Giles played like an all pro catching a team-high 40 passes with seven going for touchdowns. The same year the Bucks acquired Jimmy Giles, they spent the first round choice for Doug Williams, a quarterback with an exceptional arm. Williams started every game in 1979 and threw for nearly 2,500 yards and 18 touchdowns. He was sacked only seven times, the second lowest total in NFL history. Number 12 was the youngest quarterback to lead his team to a championship game. However, he and talented receivers, Isaac Hagans, Gordon Jones, and Larry Mucker, could not prevent week six and seven losses to New Orleans and the New York Giants. Still, the Buccaneers rebounded to capture four of their next five games, including three wins against NFC Central Division opponents. During the Week 11 rematch in Detroit, a 16-14 Tampa Bay advantage was in jeopardy until Curtis Jordan and the rest of the NFL's best defensive unit rose up to silence the Lions' final roar. Once again, these Buccaneers superheroes had saved the day. In 1979, the Tampa Bay defense led the entire NFL in every important category, beginning with toughness. Their trademark was execution that put as many as possible at the point of attack. For example, if nose tackle Randy Crowder closed off the middle, then pursuit from Mark Cotney, Wally Chambers, and Danny Reese could shut the play down. On the rare occasions when one man had to handle it himself, the Bucks had linebacker Richard Wood who led the team in tackles. But mostly, it was 100% team defense. David Lewis stripping the sweep while Dewey Selman, Jerris White, Mike Washington, Cedric Brown, Bill Kohler, Dana Nafziger, and the rest pursued the goal of making this defense the NFL's finest. Against the New York Giants in the 12th week, a Cecil Johnson hit resulted in a David Lewis touchdown a typically heads-up play for the alert all-NFC linebacker. Ricky Bell rushed for 152 yards, and two touchdown passes by Doug Williams rounded out a 31-3 route of the Giants. 
Suddenly, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers needed only one win in any of their remaining four games to win the NFC Central Division. The Bucks' first shot at the title came in Tampa Stadium, where a standing room only crowd watched John McKay's detailed game plan come to life. West, I, two tight ends, yeah. 77 and X, 28 clips. Out of baby, Ricky, that's what we need. However, executing McKay's plan wasn't going to be easy. The Vikings were the defending division champions, and they weren't eager to see a team so young steal away with their crown. Minnesota blocked three kicks as frustration mounted. somebody in there we got an excuse for everything we do let's just relax fellas they're not doing a big job anyhow but while they were not playing their best late in the fourth quarter they were still in come on let's go now time now ought to be good ought to be good Day was merely an extra point away from overtime, trailing 23 to 22. The kick was blocked, setting off a stunning chain reaction that saw the Buccaneers lose the next week to division rival Chicago. following Sunday, anger turned to shock. Well, for the third time in as many weeks, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers try to nail down what has become known as the elusive NFC Central Division crown. If the third time is a charm, then it'll happen here in San Francisco today. There's no whys, ifs, or ands, or buts. We got our butts. What we needed was Newt Rockney, and he was not here. We will attempt to uh, come back next Sunday in uh, Tampa Stadium in front of our own crowd. We've now proven we can't play on the road or in front of our own crowd. So we, we, we would like to have a neutral site. Unknowingly, McKay would get his wish as a Florida rainstorm turned Tampa Stadium into a neutral setting. However, now, when they had to, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers pulled together to fashion a championship out of the mud. The Buccaneer defense was brilliant, limiting the Chiefs to a club record of 80 total offensive yards. But on offense, fortunes were not so favorable. Opportunities began to pile up until the final quarter when the heart of a proud team began to beat. Millions waited to see if Cinderella's glass slipper would fit.
63 yards and 13 plays later, the Bucks stood on the threshold of a championship. 19-yard field goal attempt. Neil O'Donoghue awaiting the snap from Steve Wilson. It is a low snap. The kick is up. Good! The players are really whooping it up on the sidelines. This is quite a sight to see. A bunch of kids down there, they deserve it. The Buccaneers are the NFC Central Division champions. Fame pursues its ends in a number of ways. There are those whom it mocks easily. Then there are those to whom it yields grudgingly, like the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I got a game ball for the best owner. Right on, man. The youngest best football team. Together, these men had fulfilled a dream that was four years in the making. And gentlemen, who picked this to be last? We is the champs. They achieved their 10 regular season wins faster than any other expansion team ever had and made the quantum leap from worst to first.